we do like to um, push it out on social media and our um, our website. So sorry, I was just checking it was working. So for anyone that's not comfortable with that, please do let me know. And, and of course we won't. So good morning, everyone. Um, I hope the weather is nice with you, but I think it's probably not. Summer is on its way, I promise. Next week, the sun will be shining. So today, really excited to have um, another uh, seminar in our HS2 series. This one today, focusing on the very important um, labour source of HS2 um, from Birmingham to, to London. So um, I will hand over to Angela Forbes to introduce our partners, but we have three partners with us today and we also have a service lever, which is fantastic. So um, sit back and enjoy. Um, I give you Angela Forbes. OK, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to our virtual career chat. It's a great pleasure to welcome you back, and I hope you are all safe and well. Now, we are fresh off the back of Mental Health Week with the theme of nature. So taking some time out and being outdoors can put things in perspective and it can temporarily take the pressure off. So to provide calm, joy and wonder to our daily life. So try to prioritise, try find time to take a moment. Our mental health programme is open to all, so feel free to use us and to find out more. Now, this morning, we have a great lineup for you today. As part of our appointment on HS2 as the military job brokerage partner, we are running a series of these virtual career chats to bring the tier one contractors and labour supply agencies closer to you, our military community. Today, we're going to take the labour supply agencies, we're going to bring them to you and you're going to hear from all three of them who are the formal partners. And today we'll hear from Brooke, Brooke Parsons of Danny Sullivan, from Kim McGinty, VGC, and then we'll hear from McGinley Support Services, and that's Janet Hector and John Gibson, who himself is ex-military. We'll do a QA and a at the end, but feel free to submit any questions as we go through. So without further ado, we'll pass over to our first speaker, Brooke, and we'll all turn our, our screens off, Brooke. No problem. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to put up my presentation for you all. And actually, let me just make sure I'm sharing my sound as well. There you go. And hopefully you guys can all see that. And Perfect. Gonna... Thank you. No problem. So as I mentioned, my name is Brooke Parsons. I am the Corporate Social Responsibility Manager for the Danny Sullivan Group. But today we have Kim and Janet with me today and we make up the labour desk um, at SES, but we are also on other parts of HS2. So we are all corporate social responsibility managers. So I'll be talking to you a bit about what that, it, that what that involves. But actually today we are joining forces to offer you guys so much opportunity and hopefully lots of knowledge and insight. So grab the opportunity today, ask us loads of questions and hopefully we can all get you into employment within the construction industry. So who are we though and what do we do? So we all provide a skilled professional labour to the UK's most prestigious infrastructure projects. So today we're obviously talking specifically about the opportunities available in HS2 as it's alive and kicking at the moment and will be for a number of years. But actually we all we have lots of different projects across the UK um, and they are all really, really incredible and exciting infrastructure projects to be involved with. So we staff our clients uh, with the most outstanding capability and exceptional performance with our people. So we, people are at the core of everything we do as organisations here today. But how do we provide that outstanding capability and exceptional performance? Well, actually, we do that by prioritising safety, well-being and the development of our people. So today, some of you may not have considered a career within construction before. You may be coming to us fresh, new and actually that's perfect because it's, it's a great time to be joining the industry. The government has been investing billions of pounds into HS2 and actually great time to be joining us and develop yourself within the industry. And actually because of the skill shortage right now, we're actually seeing development of people happen much faster than usual. So really exciting time to be joining us. And sometimes when we're talking about labour supplies, we can get mistaken for agencies, but actually all of our staff are directly employed by each organisation. So even if you are employed by a VGC, McGinley or Danny Sullivan group today, when you step foot onto 
HS2, you will still be employed by that, that organisation of your choice. You'll be PAYE, you'll get your holiday, you'll get your sick and all the benefits that come with being directly employed with, an, with one of these organisations. But actually, what are the other benefits of, of our organisations and why work for a labour supplier like ourselves on HS2? Well, today, as I mentioned, we're all working together. So although we are competitors within the industry, once we are on a project, we join forces together and we all work as one team. So when you are on site on HS2, you may have a slightly different logo on your high vis, but actually we're all working together for a common goal for the client. The common goal for us as corporate social responsibility managers is to make sure that our organisations are leaving a lasting legacy within the communities we work in. So although you'll be on such an exciting infrastructure project, you'll also be helping the local communities of which you'll, you'll be a part of. So that can include social, economic or environmental. But today I'm going to be talking to you a bit more about the social and economical values that you can put in when working for an organisation. So obviously, our common goal for the client is obviously to build infrastructure and do it really well. But obviously we can't do that without the skills and people like yourselves. But we're trying to encourage more women in the industry. So any women on the call today, we're trying to make the construction industry a more approachable and adaptable place for women to be uh, inducted into. We are all partners of Women Into Construction and we do mentorships, we do events, we offer placements um, and actually we are also part of a, a flexible working trial so to see if we could, that can work for on-site staff. You're going to have lots of people around you for all different backgrounds, all different experiences and all offering unique opportunities. For, for yourselves today you're going to be offering your military experience, you'll be service leavers and you'll be able to offer so much within our industry but you'll also have people who may be ex-offenders, you may have people who might have previously been homeless and you might have people, I know Rory, our health, the safety and wellbeing manager was talking to me yesterday about someone who was a barrister on site. So there are lots of different walks of life and the industry welcomes everyone. So in the picture on the right hand side, you'll see everyone from the Labour desk today, colleagues from VGC and McGinley and Danny Sullivan Group working with an organisation like Buses for Homeless to help employ homeless people onto the project. And that's just one of the ways that we're trying to help the local community. As I mentioned, and some of you may know, that we are trying to combat the skills shortage. So we really do welcome newcomers into the industry. And how else do we do this? Well, we also inspire the next generation. So we're STEM ambassadors. We go into local schools and colleges. We try and bust the myths of what a construction site looks like and really encourage people to be taking those STEM, STEM activities um, and coming into the industry because it is a really exciting and booming place to be working. And you can become a STEM ambassador when you're joining the organisation. So not only are you going to be upskilled, you're going to be learning new skills, you're going to be going in maybe obviously as a general operative, you could be coming out as a supervisor. It really is that quick. But alongside that, you can also become a STEM ambassador with the organisation that you choose. And then you can also help us to go into schools and really talk about your experience in coming into the industry. As really fresh, we've all just come off a sector based work academy with HS2. Um, which went really well. Again, we're offering people from different sectors. So it could be people who have been affected by COVID through um, redundancies in the retail, hospitality sectors, again, who haven't thought about construction before. Uh, and if you're interested in taking part in a sector based work academy to get more of a flavour, to get a CSCS card, that's part of the programme, then you're more than welcome to talk to us today about that as well. But why, again, work within the construction industry and what do we do as a labour desk to help it make a better place to work? Well, we're all about being an inclusive and diverse workforce. So all of the staff coming on to HS2 um, have an EDI training as part of the supply chain school. As a labour desk, we've created a bespoke training programme talking about equality, diversity and inclusion. So everyone coming onto site knows what to expect, knows the do's and don'ts, and everyone should be able to work and, 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 and be free to, to have a chat but also be respectful of everyone's differences. The Supply Chain School, uh, I want to talk to you today and make sure that you have a look at that afterwards. It offers lots of free resources for you to have a look at um, and get to know more about what the industry has to offer. Specifically today, fairness, inclusion and respect as part of the Supply Chain School is something that we're, we're all passionate about as a Labour desk and is a culture that we're trying to change within the industry and we're trying to do that together. We want to have an open door policy for SITE. We want you guys to be able to talk about any observations that you might see that are a concern for you and not feel like you're going to be reprimanded for that. 
But I'm going to just quickly show you a very quick video about what fairness, inclusion, respect looks like within the industry um, and why it's going to be such a great place to work. Welcome to our workplace. Everyone here is different. We each have our own DNA, backgrounds, education, experiences, lifestyles and interests. That diversity means we each bring unique, valuable ideas to work. Whatever our similarities or differences, we want every person here to be respected and treated fairly so that we all feel included, safe and supported to do the very best job we can. The professional language and behaviours we prefer here might be different to those in other workplaces. Everyone is entitled to their views, but opinions should not be expressed if they might cause offence or result in anyone feeling excluded. For example, let's avoid jokes or banter that might be hurtful to anyone. Bullying, harassment, victimisation and discrimination are not acceptable here. If you become aware of such behaviours against yourself or others, you can challenge them. But you might prefer to report them to a manager, supervisor, or through a system that will either be explained at the end of this film or in your induction pack. Remember, the standards we walk by are the standards we accept. Because everyone is different, we all have different needs. We try to make reasonable adjustments so that every person is able to continue working safely and securely even when they have a health consideration or a visible or invisible disability. If you identify with this, please speak to a manager or supervisor. Let's all help to promote fairness, inclusion and respect and make our workplaces even better for everyone. Again, this is just one of the common goals um, that we share as an industry, but also specifically as a labour desk. Don't start again. OK, and last but not least, uh, if I haven't sold it to you already, um, really, really what we, ta we take very seriously is mental health and well-being. And all of our organisations have a strong focus on this within the, uh, the industry and our on-site culture. I know all like, the three organisations here today have mental health first aiders. We also have mental health first aider trainers. So again, that's something that you can be a part of when joining. We support our staff in a number of ways and we all work with different organisations and charities to make sure that we are offering the best support to our staff. We have regular toolbox talks on mental health covering lots of different topics and we work with mind and state of mind support and recently i was part of a workshop where mcginnies was talking specifically to schools about youth mental health and preventing mental health uh, coming into the industry so really really want to make a strong focus on that and again is a, is a common goal that we share within the industry so I'll leave you with this. We are all keen to leave a lasting legacy within the communities that we work in and offering opportunities to everyone. And today specifically talking to service leavers like yourself and hopefully offering you opportunities within this sector. These will be handed out, I'm sure, sent around at the end. But again, these are all the contact details of myself, Kim and Janet today. And again, grab the opportunity by the horns and, and really ask as many questions as, as you like today and get as much as you can from this from this experience. And thanks so much. Brooke, that was fantastic. Really, really impressed watching that. So looking forward to hearing from the other two speakers. Um, Kim McGinty, if you're able to join us. Hi, Kim. Hi, morning. Um, I'll just share my screen. Bear with me just a moment. I'm not as technical as Brooke. If you can just let me know when you can see that. That's it. Perfect. Perfect. OK, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for coming this morning. Um, my name is Kimberly McGinty. I'm the CSR manager for VGC Group. So as Brooke, um, great presentation uh, showed you, we are part of the three Labour Desk on the SES project. So. Um, we are the people that are hiring all the trades and labour roles to put that project together. So to this morning, I'm going to talk about the different routes into construction, the different types of cards that you would need, the different types of training that would benefit your CV, um, what you can do in your spare time and when you've got some leave to bulk your CV, how that will be useful to you and what's useful to us. 
Um, so I'm just going to predominantly talk about uh, the skills and the roles within the construction on on site. Um, and Janet will take over and do the rail um, and John will talk about his experience as well. And then we'll be here for any questions. So don't, uh, feel free to ask any questions as we go along. So VGC and Danny Sullivan's and McGinley's, we all work in the same sector. So we work across civils, nuclear, motorways, airports, rail and construction. So the roles that we're looking at for SES were predominant construction at the moment, but they will move into rail. So we have we have offices all across the UK as well. So don't think that you are going to be secular to one section. You know, there is the opportunity as you grow and as you grow your skills um, and, and the career path that you will be able to travel where where you want to. So why construction? Why move into us? Um, as Brooke said, we are facing a big skill shortage. You'll hear this with a lot of presentations from companies like ourselves that with HS2 alone, I think it takes something like 33,000 people to put that project together and with ageing workforce as well. It does mean that what we're having is this big gap of really experienced people. And so the role of the CSR department is really to start spreading our wings and looking to our wider communities and the people in and around those projects about where we can then start building and, and in, introducing more people into the industry. And so, as Brooke said, we do that with young people, we do that with different programmes, but we have a big ex-military, a serving military um, programme where we really want you guys and girls to come and join the industry. Um, a recent survey, 77% of construction professionals said that ex-service personnel could really help to plug that skills gap. So why do we think that? you guys you bring so much more to us on our sites that we really need your expertise and you think about the transferable skills that you already have with the roles that you do at the moment so you know the, the team working and your leadership skills working to tight time restraints your time your exceptional timekeeping your communication your ability to follow instruction you're used to working outdoors in all types of weather you're very task orientated and focused you all ha already have all of that um, industry experience with health and safety you're able to handle large operations and your problem solving and you're completely used to working with diverse teams and this is really what we're looking for to build our teams um, and you already have that so with us we don't need to show you all of those different types of things that we need what we're looking for in a skilled worker because you bring that to the table already so make that shine in your CV have a look at, at the different transferable skills that you have and and put that in your CV because that's what we're looking to put these projects together with HS2 we've got 10 years worth of work so it isn't sometimes it is a foot in the door but because we're growing at such a, 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 ra a rapid speed as the project develops and goes and grows we will able to start looking at your career plan and we will able to start looking at your upskilling and looking about your different roles and and what it is that you want to do so um i've just put this up on here because this is where it shows you the different types of roles and really how they spread out and how they would move and generate as you start your journey with us in the construction so in the industry so if you look at the orange box that's your general operative so that's your what what you would know as a laborer and that's your foot in the door with the green cscs card and as brooke said some of us are able to ha help you with that build force is able to help you with that you do have your training pocket as well so you can use that go on to the cit website and have a look at the different places that you can you can do that so just a touch screens test and you would need to do the health and safety and i can go on to that in a sec so this is your foot in the door on site so that's your general operative and that's just general labouring duties and then as you can see this branches out to the left and the right so from there you can move into a traffic marshalling role um, which we're going to gangers supervisors logistics types of roles I know we get a lot of logistics guys that come through to us so they would start at a different level depending on their experience and tickets you can also move to the left and you can go into ground worker positions so that goes to your blue cards and your skilled worker cards and I'm going to go on to cards in, in a second, so don't worry about that. And then, as you can see, these then move into different MVQ trades. So carpenters, steel fixers. So when you're looking at different trades that you want to look into, things like steel fixers are really hard to come by. So 
always a really good ticket to have in our industry because we really struggle to find good steel fixers. But bear in mind that experience is also key. So when you're looking at the time that you're leaving or when you're going to be leaving, get in touch with us. We can talk to you about work placements or get in touch with Caroline and try and put yourself out onto sites that you can get a bit more of an idea of what we're looking for and, and something to bulk your CV to show that you've done some construction experience. And as you can see, you've got the trade hand and then these, these all move into foreman, supervisor, trade manager roles. So a number of our, our guys and girls on site have moved up the ladder and gone into sort of labour management roles. Some of our directors will come from site. I worked on site myself and I'm now in, in management roles as well. So the changeover is really quite fast. Um, there is a lot of opportunity for growth. And with the skill shortage that we keep talking about, there is an opportunity for you to really develop your skills, get some of the training underneath your belt and move up the career ladder really fast. And with the way that your your ethos works hand in hand with the construction ethos, too. So they do marry up very closely. So if we just quickly go on to the different types of cards. So the first card that you would get with no experience would be your green CSCS card. So this is your labourer card and it's valid for five years. Most of the cards are. You'd have to do the health and safety CITB safety uh, test, which is a day's course. You can do it online um, and then you do the touch screens test. So very similar to your theory test um, when you do your driving um, so it's very it's just a basic health and safety. And so this kind of gives you an access to site. So cleaners, labourers and some of the lower skilled uh, ground workers, they would need this card. From there, you can then start to apply for your skilled worker, which is your blue CSCS card. So that can be related with any MVQ or an apprenticeship. So don't rule out apprenticeship. So. I know that a lot of people look at apprenticeships and, and for some of us that will show our age, the YTS scheme and things like that. And that's not the that's not the case with apprenticeships. Now we've got a number of lads on our sites that are doing different levels of apprenticeships. There's higher degree apprenticeships that we can put you on um, and, it, and it doesn't change your pay rate. So you would get exactly the same rates as everybody else on site. You would just have that bolster of an apprenticeship with the 20 percent off um, site learning. So always worth having a look and having a discussion with whoever it is that you're going to take the role with about whether you there is an apprenticeship available for you. Um, so the blue CSES card is a ground worker. There'll be uh, pipe layers, shuttering carpenters. So it depends on the MVQ and the skill that you're going for. Um, all three of us would help you gain that while you start working with us. So if you were just starting as the general operative and then working your way in, then you would start with us. And then what we would do is then develop you and put you on further training as we go along. There's also the CPCS, so that's a construction plant competence scheme. So that enables you to be a traffic marshal, banksman slinger, um, plant operators, dumper roller drivers, etc. They all need this competent operator card. And then um, a lot of guys have got the gold card. So at your supervisory technical occupation, so your foreman, um, your site supervisors and things like that have all got this related card as well. So other useful training for you to maybe look at while you're thinking about how to train, how to spend your, your training um, budget. Cat and Jenny is always really good, can find spaces, manual handling, small tools, first aid. For some people that are thinking about doing scaffolding or want to move into foreman, um, working at heights is really useful. Again, when we're looking at your CV, um, site experience is really essential. For those of you that have just got the green CSES card and want to start as general operative foot in the door, we can help you with that um, and we can start you off on that level. That's not a problem for anybody else that might have the skilled card or want to go into supervisory positions because of your role previously. You will need to have that site experience. It's not it's really key that we you've had that understanding of working on site and how the teams work together, um, what the different types of roles do and, and how they're pulled together to put that project together. So we can help you with work placements. Um, Caroline will be working with all three of us so that we can develop work placements and tailor them to you on the HS2 site so that you can get that to bolster your CV. 
So as Brooke said, so I think all three of us will probably reiterate this throughout this morning. Um, what do we have to offer you? So as Brooke said, the health and well-being and the mental health is a massively important issue for us. So you are supported throughout that. And there is opportunity for you to be a mental health first aider or to be part of the wellbeing team. We do have competitive pay. So you are on pay AYE. We're not subcontracting you. Um, there is opportunity for overtime. You have your direct labour manager support. We will look at upskilling you at all times. So there is progression. Um, we are not somebody that will offer you two days here and three days there. It is long term and it is sustainable work. So you'll be working on the HS2 project, hopefully for 10 years. But if there is an opportunity that you want to go into a different type of role and that role is not available on that site, we can look at all the different sites that we have across the UK and give you those as an option if you wanted to upskill and change your career or um, be part of a different team. And as we said, we know this project is such a long term project. It's a really exciting project. It's doing, so, you know, it's the biggest thing in, in Europe at the moment. We are part of this huge growing team and this now has never been the better time to start because starting your career with us now is you've got the opportunity to be on the site while it's still relatively a fledgling site and then look at developing yourself. So, you know, in five, six years time, who knows where you'll all be while working for us. So a really great time to start with us. So to join us as a minimum, you would need your green CSCS card, which is just a touchscreen set of test. Your right of work to you in the work in the UK, your ID, and you need the ability to pass a clean drug and alcohol test and to understand that we do do random ones on site as well. So we have, a, like yourselves, we have a zero tolerance policy as well. So these are just some of the different roles on the SCS section of HS2 that we are always looking for. So the route that we're doing is Euston to West Ryslip, but all three of us are working all the way up to Birmingham on this project as well. So don't rule out moving about. Um, so if you see on the right hand side, this is what we're currently looking for. Carpenters, cleaners, ground workers, general operative, um, plant controllers, slingers, signalers. So there's a there's a wealth and breadth of of different types of roles. So uh, come and talk to us if you've got any questions, then we're all happy to answer anything that you need. OK, and that's me. Kimberly, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. No problem. And we'll ask um, yeah. Janet, Janet to, join to join us. I see John Gibson's Gibson arrived, arrived as well. I'm going a bit echoey. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Janet and I am the Corporate Social Responsibility Manager for McGinley Support Services. And I'm joined here um, by my colleague, John Gibson, who is going to talk to you a little bit afterwards as an ex-service leader. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the rail size and how to get started, really, and how to access the training. Um, although HS2 is a huge project and the largest rail infrastructure project in Europe, it will be a few years before any real safety critical track work will take place. At the moment, there are a, a, a few um, rail requirements um, on SCS, but they are few and far between. They are usually for experienced people and they are for the odd day or so. But John will, could explain a bit more about that if we wanted to know. So I've just shown here um, in 2018, HS2 um, predicted how many how much how many staff that they're going to need. And rail, um, if you can move on a bit, please, Brooke. Rail makes up about 36 percent of the total. But as you can see, the peak of the rail is not due for a few years yet. I mean, the thing is, you know, everything has actually slowed down a little bit and, and things are starting off a little bit later than they did. So you've got plenty of time to get all that experience and training in. It doesn't mean they're not going to be needed beforehand. That's just when the peak is going to be. And that's really when most of the construction and the tunnelling work will have taken place. Um, OK, Brooke. So um, as Kim pointed out earlier, um, because of your training, particularly for, um, for, for rail and for entry into a rail career, um, you have a fantastic grounding um, to know what's going to be expected to be out on track. You know, nine times I think you're punctual, you're reliable, you, you're used to working nights and weekends. And that is when the, the, the bulk of the rail work takes place, because obviously 
um, HS2 aside, you can't work on the track while there's trains running running past it. You need to be able to pass a drugs and alcohol test at all times and random testing is, is taking place on, on track, but also on the construction sites. You need to be able to pass a safety critical medical as work can be physically hard. But what I mean by that is, so for argument's sake, um, it doesn't mean that so, if, so for, uh, if I use for an example, abraxia, we have we had one of our apprentices recently presented with abraxia. It didn't mean that he couldn't work, and that's when you lose your balance. This slight you know, neurological thing. When you if you lose your balance a little bit, we have to be careful that you don't fall over onto the track. So you you're risk assessed and and stuff like that. So it's that type of medical that you have to pass. You know, you're going to be good with your hands and able to use tools efficiently. All weather conditions, Kim mentioned a little while ago about all the weather conditions. Um, team player, obviously, it's really important, particularly on track, that um, you are a team player. Every You go out in, they're called gangs, rather unfortunate term, but when you go out in, in, a, in a rail gang, everyone within that gang will have a, a specific job that they need to do. And so if um, that's why you have to be able to work as a team. If any one of those people doesn't turn up for work, or whatever, they have to be replaced. You can't just do without them like, like you would do in a normal job. So you need to be disciplined and have a sense of responsibility as, as well as a strong safety work ethic and the ability to stay calm in emergencies, of course. Um, moving on to, um, you may well have heard this primary sponsorship and sub-sponsorship. It's to do with um, it's to do with the Sentinel rules and Sentinel is a safety system that manages all of your safety and your fatigue. So before you can access any type of training, regardless of what experience you have had throughout your career, you have to um, you have to find a Sentinel approved sponsor. Obviously, all three of us here are approved um, sponsors. We go through rigorous training. And, and audits and annual checks and compliance checks and to make sure that we have those management systems in place so that we look after our workers because safety is a priority. Um, the industry protocol does not allow candidates to book onto a course and pay for it yourself, even if you don't have a sponsor. And it's all to do with safety. So once you have a sponsor, then um, your, your, your primary sponsor will look after all of your training and your compliance and it will provide you with your main work bank. Um, if for any reason, it's unusual, but if for any reason uh, your primary sponsor is unable to offer you um, enough work for a particular week or a month, then you can have up to two uh, sub-sponsors under Sentinel rules. Next one, please, Rick. So, Rail careers and, uh, and HS2. So the PTS, you may well have heard PTS. Um, the PTS is the basic training, it's personal track safety, and it allows you access to the rail network and to be able to work near a railway line, but not on it. So it's normally uh, two days, it's classroom based, and you learn all about the rules and regulations. This type of qualification is more than suitable for anyone that's been in a civils role. So like if you, if uh, as Kim mentioned earlier, you go on and you become an electrician or a scaffolder or a steel fix or whatever. If you wanted to work near the line and, and that, that would aid your career, then you only need a, um, a two day PTS. However, if you want to go onto the track and work on the track, then you do need a track. It's called a track induction and it's a 10 day course. And that includes um, everything that you will need to work in a safety critical environment. So it's essential for all roles. I know a lot of guys from the uh, forces go on. They want to do signalling because of their, their background in, uh, um, whilst they were in the forces. So overhead line electrification. Most of our stuff is renewals and maintenance as well. So all of these things you will need to track induction for. Um, that's 10 days. Usually you get manual handling, um, fire awareness, you get OLEP one, which is the overhead line, first aid, and then you get a five day training on a, on a track and it has to be an approved track. So, um, and then you get issued with your Sentinel card. So, um, and. Every time if you, you have to have your Sentinel card with you at all, at all points. And as you acquire more and more um, 
tickets or qualifications or then it gets added to that card so every time that swipe then you can say that i am i am competent to be able to use this tool i'm confident to be able to do this and it all goes on that card that's the next bit thank you right this is just a few options really um i know i've seen in some of the messages somebody was asking about training and uh, brooke mentioned the swap that we did recently together but it's a little bit different for rail because of the sponsorship side of things. So depending on your own personal circumstances, you will need to access funding for the course. But there are different ways of doing it. Of course, you can self-fund using your resettlement fund um, and any of our businesses will be able to facilitate that. Uh, and you can benefit from the rates that we have in, in, in place already. So um, if you wanted to go down that route, then just contact any of us and say that, yeah, this is the, this is the way you want to go and then we'll organise that for you. If you don't have any of that fund or, or uh, you're not in a position to do that or you're unemployed, then the, the Department of Work and Pensions, the, the job centres, they are such a good uh, place to start. Um, a lot of people fun, get funny about wanting to claim universal credit. Really, if you're unemployed, please claim it because it opens up so many doors for you to access free training. So um, at the moment, I'm, I'm literally working on um, a traineeship with um, four or five lads in, in um, North London who have been unemployed for a long time. They've got their ex-offenders and they've been able to access this training. And in a few weeks time, we'll be able to put them you know, in, in full time employment. So don't don't shy away from anything like that. They're always in conjunction with um, uh, the sector based work academies are always in conjunction with training partners and, and an employer and, and where HS2 is concerned, it will be with whatever Labour desk, whoever is in that Labour desk on, on any particular project. Um, sometimes DWP can access um, funding for, uh, for a one to one on a one to one basis. They've got a fund called an LVP fund, low value procurement, I think it means. and um, if there was just one person on their own and they couldn't get on a, tra on a on a training course for whatever reason, then speak to the the, the, the job centre. They can help you. As I mentioned, I'm just doing some traineeships and I put it in. I know that, you know, it is for young people, but young people do come out of the army. Young people, you know, sometimes it's not always for them and they want to try something different. So I put that in there because that's the, you know, that's a 12 week training course. And then we provide work placement for you, one one shift a week for up to 70 hours, not in the one week, obviously. <laughs> and then um, uh, that, you know, you then become you have all the necessary qualifications. And as Kim mentioned earlier, don't shy away from apprenticeships. I mean, they're, they're fantastic. They're, they're, I've, I've got about 30 apprentices at the moment and half of them are over 30. So don't don't shy away from them. They're a fantastic um, way to um to, to move forward with a new career so although the 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 rail part of the of the business of hs2 is a little way off you've got plenty of time to get some training and within within a year or so that's going to really start ramping up because as more and more parts of the project open up then you know things move faster uh, and we're going to need a lot of people to start laying the track and and, and getting on with that so it's you know it and in the meantime there, there there's plenty of other work up and down the country with all of us so um yeah so it's just something to think about thank you janet that was really useful a lot of brilliant information in there and join your colleague be able to join us yeah. hi john hi there uh, morning everyone uh, thank you for having me um I just wanted to just speak about my experiences, obviously, X Forces. Uh, so uh, I joined in 2001 Royal Engineers, uh, was attached to 5-9 Commando. Um, obviously, I got to a point in, in my career in the Army where I was looking to leave. Um, fortunately, one of my cousins worked for McGinley, uh, and he talked to me about roles in civils, which was obviously new to me. Uh, so I left in 2006. Uh, I started on the East London Line project uh, obviously in London, uh, as a general operative. Um, I, I quickly rose up through the ranks just because obviously my previous experience, hard working, uh, timekeeping, which is which is paramount in our industry. Um, and obviously I was a ganger within uh, 12 months, then 18 months I was a foreman. Uh, moved on to uh, Blackfriars once that project finished. 
Uh, then I went to Heathrow. And then I took another career turn and decided to start working on power stations. Uh, so and I progressed in there for another four years. Uh, we have a small family, a, a young family. Um, I was offered a job uh, on, on, as, as, as a labour manager for McGinley. Uh, working down in South Wales on track uh, with minor, minor package works. Uh, and then obviously I got offered a, a position back in London on the Northern Line extension. Which was a it's a it's a two three kilometer drives uh, basically from Kennington to uh, Stockwell to extend the line. Uh, I then moved on to Thames Tideways, the account manager, uh, which is a 27, 27 mile long uh, super sewer underneath the Thames. Uh, and now I'm in my current position, which is account manager on the HS2 contracts that we've been awarded. Uh, and like, like I say, I think. Um, what we what we're what we're already envisaging on HS2 is there's going to be a massive labour shortage, uh, just be, just due to the, the sheer volume of works going on. And what what myself and uh, BGC and Danny Sullivan's are trying to expand into different areas, particularly for the ex for uh, armed forces uh, who have left or are still currently serving, to to to, to be basically put out there what what we can offer because. I mean, from my own experience, it was an easy transition. It's long hours, it's outdoor work, it's physical. Uh, so so I, I, I have no no reason why you, it isn't a suitable career for you. Um, what we offer is obviously direct employment, uh, long-term work, uh, career progression. Um, and like I say, it's, it's sense of achievement. HS2 is the biggest job in Europe. Uh, it, it's a phenomenal uh, project uh, and I've been working on it for the last six months. and. I can only see it getting better, and like I say, it, it, the, the the jobs are there. Uh, we just obviously want to give you as much information, try to guide you down what we think or you think you'd be more suited to. There's numerous different trades, from ground workers, pipe layers, uh, plant operatives, steel fixers, carpenters, and obviously uh, level entry roles. And then once you get there, you can then decide, oh well, you might take an interest in ground works or uh, carpentry or steel fixing. And then we can assist. Uh, we are we we we're fully committed to upskilling our workers because ultimately the you're only as good as the workers you put out. Um, yeah, so I'd, it's very brief. Uh, I think I've, I think I've covered as much as I I, fit, I can. Uh, but if you've got any questions, then please feel free to ask, and I'll I'll, I'll try my best to answer any questions you have. OK, John, thank you very much. Thank you for that. If I could ask all the speakers just to switch their cameras back on. Again, if you do have a question, just raise your hands. You're more than welcome to jump in. If Caroline's there, um, if she could just guide us. So for all those listening that thought this is fantastic, um, what should they do next? What's the first thing? Absolutely. I've been scribbling notes and, and I just wanted to say before I say that, you know, we always say that in construction, the career progression really is good. And I think John is a prime example. You know, he's been boots on the ground to now accounts manager. So it's so a fantastic, John. And, and thanks for joining us today. Yeah. So those of you that are interested, please just get in touch. Give me a call and um, send me an email. Um, I'll put my email and my phone number in the chat box and then we'll, we'll start connecting. We'll start connecting you to these uh, live opportunities. We'll give you some mentoring as well um, and also some work placements. We can source those for you. But yeah, please just just get in touch, um, even if it's just to talk about it, even if you just want to chat with one of the lovely ladies about you know where the, you might sit in the sector angela is fantastic at talking about where those transferable skills sit in the sector in the industry and we're just here to support you so yeah just get in touch okay thank you right well i'll kick off with a few questions so again anybody's free to, to join in um Brooke, you mentioned so probably one of the key points and i think all of you touched on it as you as well janet and um, you mentioned apprenticeships so what does an apprenticeship actually look like and how much of a pay cut is there if you go down the apprentice route? Because obviously our service leavers are coming out in their 20s, 30s and 40s. They've got families, as John's mentioned. So that's obviously a mute point for them. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, apprenticeships are obviously depending on your level. But as Kim mentioned, if you're on site already in, in a particular role, you will stay paid at that current pay rate. So you don't drop to an like a standard like what people usually think of as an apprentice wage. You stay on what you're skilled at and on site and then you're just kind of adding your apprenticeship alongside working. So 
hopefully you, you wouldn't really be seeing a, a, a pay cut whilst training and whilst taking on your apprenticeship. Um, the apprenticeship depends again on, on, on the people here. So once they're on site and they've had a look at what they, they're interested in and the type of roles they want to get into, they can approach uh, their, their line manager and then obviously ourselves as well and say, OK, I'm interested in, in still like still fixing. And then, OK, so we'll upskill you. We'll, we'll suggest different development routes. So sometimes apprenticeship might not be appropriate. It might be an MVQ uh, and then we'll help guide you through that experience. OK, and Janet? Um, yes, yeah, for rail, it's a little bit different um, because it's, it's normally for a level two MVQ. Um, it's normally about 13 months you will be required, there's about 30% classroom training. And for that particular training, you're normally paid an apprentice rate, which is, I don't know, five pound an hour, whatever. However, you can make up that. So when, when you get past the first four weeks and you've done your track induction, um, you can then go out on track and then you can um, gain experience and work and be paid at the agreed rate for when you're going out on track. So but and there's no limits to that. So you cannot. So on, on some weeks when you don't have training, you can be out for up to 50 hours. So there's plenty of opportunity. You need to be able to budget. Certainly, if you are on a rail apprenticeship, I, I would say, um, because you need to be able to eke out for when you are. You do have to be in training. It's a little bit different on construction because on, uh, on construction, so it's, it's I think it's about 20 percent on the job training. Kim, you might know more, more than me. Um, but um, it's done in, in two day blocks, whereas sometimes on the track you're taken off for four weeks and then put and then put back on. So it's a little bit different, but there's no reason why you, you can't earn um, uh, a decent salary, even if it is a starting salary. But it's one of the few ways to get on and, and get a solid rail training background. And the, the key is you find the job first and then you look at upskilling the apprenticeship route with the, the employer. OK, and Kimberly, you mentioned probably a key point in terms of pay YE. So all the and I think for all of you, the, the, the candidates come in employed by the, the Labour desk. Is that right? Yeah, so if they're with us or Danny Sullivan's uh, McGinnis, we all work the same. So you would work for us on a PAYE basis. We pay your tax, national insurance, you accrue holiday, sick leave, but with us you also get full pension, life cover, all of the stuff that we get in the office, all our site staff are also entitled to as well. Okay, that's brilliant. And you get it's long, consistent work. It's not, I mean, you, somebody's just mentioned yeah. the point there, you are completely changing the perception of industry by <laughs> doing what you're doing. And I am so overwhelmed by it and, and so delighted to hear it. Um, but again, you're there for the candidate. And I, again, that consistent work is, is, is key to that. Yeah, it's not a case of, I think a lot of people's misconceptions about construction is sometimes that you've got a day, you know, a day here and a day that, I suppose house building is very different to infrastructure where you get a day's work and and sometimes, you know, when, when I worked in that side of fields, it, it was, you know, you're three days on and if it was raining, you wouldn't be in that day and you wouldn't be paid. So it doesn't work like that for us. So, you know, our contracts with them, with the guys, they will be long term sustainable work. And when that job was finished, for instance, like with Crossrail as we're closing down, we're now looking at where our, our guys and girls that work for us on site can now move to different projects and upskill or move across, etc. So there's no. Yeah, the, the thing as well is within civil infrastructure, it's it's it, there's always going to be continuous work because everything needs upgrading, maintaining. The population is getting bigger, so we need to obviously build. There's there's a lot of uh, uh, projects that obviously we've all earmarked for future Low Thames Crossing, Stonehenge Bypass. These are mo most of these contracts are five five to six years long, you know. So we're always looking at the next uh, project as well for our workers and. As Kimberly mentioned, we we like to maintain our uh, core workers and just move them move them to the next project. Okay, perfect. And um, I think it was mentioned by you all as well. Um, obviously, our candidates come along to think I am interested in real or infrastructure construction and spending some some time 
close to the front line or a couple of days on site doing work placements would, would help. So the, the labour desks offer that opportunity as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We so, do that. We all work together with placements on, on a range of our sites as well. I think with the transition, work placements work really well so that you've got that site experience. You're just a bit more employable. Not that they're not employable, they really are, but having that rounded experience on site and also having a look at the different types of roles that they feel that they would be more suitable for. OK, no, that's great. And John, you're you're savvy now, so <laughs> you're no longer military. You're relatively savvy. And how, how are you finding it? Well, it's I mean, yeah, it's been it's 16 years since I left, so it, I'm uh, I think I'm getting getting adjusted to civil life now. So but I still keep in contact with a lot of my, um, a lot of my friends who I met from my career and yeah it's uh it's it's it is a difficult transition because you 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 you're sort of institutionalized aren't you and you you waiting to be told what to do whereas when you're on site a lot of it is but thinking on your own and uh using your own initiative and and, and, and it'll be noticed and that's how you progress and and in terms of are there any of your military traits or, or training that kick in sometimes yeah, we'll definitely work as part of a team, which is fundamental to the forces. Uh, timekeeping, I'm always five minutes before any meeting, so. <laughs> no, that's that's really, really good to hear. And are you, in terms of um, the military environment within each of the Labour desks, then does one already exist? Is that a soft landing that will be in place for them? Yeah. Yeah, you know, nosing brick. You've, you've got a, a little military cohort there already. At, at, yes. um, yeah. I think all of us do. I think we all have um, ex ex forces leaders. So yeah, yeah. You do. You do get a lot of ex forces in the industry already. Mm. Uh, I found that when I first started, uh, particularly on the East London line, my uh, GF was ex forces. So there is a lot. There is a lot of guys already in the industry. Okay, perfect. And Caroline. Do you know what? I'm just trying to lower my hand and I haven't been able to lower it. Kim's answered the question, so it was just to answer Ryan's question. But thank you, Kim. She's just answered it in the chat box. No problem. OK, fair. and in terms of um, the variety of roles that are out there at the moment, so how do if somebody just wanted to whet the appetite, should they go to your website to check out which roles are available? Just because after this call, a lot of people will be thinking, right, get me, get me to it. Where, where do I go? So is the website the first place or? I mean, they can yeah. come directly to each and every one of us. Okay. So that we yeah. have to do a bit more of a tailored, let's talk you through it rather than, you know, sometimes you can get to the website and then navigating around it. If you're not too sure where you fit at the moment, we're all really happy to support that and have those conversations. Just either drop us an email and we'll pick up the phone and give you a call and talk you through the different options and work through what would work better yeah. for each person, I think. Yeah. Definitely. Like I say, I mentioned a lot of the blue collar roles, but we do have white collar roles as well. So like QSs, commercial, document controllers, labour managers, account managers, uh, obviously on the rail side, which is probably more uh, for, uh, specific to the sig oil signals, we have SNT. Uh, so obviously their experience would be really good for that uh, division in the rail. OK, and do you have guys and girls that are on digs during the week? So maybe people coming down from Glasgow, Edinburgh, Newcastle that, that stay. Yeah, so that, that can be accommodated as well. Right, OK, fantastic. And as Caroline has just said there, for all our candidates, if you go to Caroline in the first instance, she will refer you over um, and we'll be able to, to take it from there. Um, but listen, I thought I was how well you are all collaborating is incredible. So credit to every single one of you. It's a lesson for us all. Um, and thank you so much for your time this morning. I can see this this session being hugely popular. It's been really insightful. So, so thank you very much for that. And I'll pass back to Caroline. Brilliant. Yeah, no, no, thank you, guys. Um, it, it's been really insightful briefing session on the core ro roles that HS2 needs to operate. So and, and, and loads of opportunities for our, our uh, military candidates. So thank you, as always. Um, so as we've said, please just do get in touch for any support you need, um, advice, uh, mentoring, anything. We're here to support you into the sector. We're really keen to get more of you into the sector. So do please keep getting in touch. Um, so uh, next week we've we, we've had a, we've had one every week. We don't normally do that, but next week we are continuing our HS2 series. 
and we have um, Joint Venture Align joining us and um, they'll be talking about their opportunities in, in the South uh, slash South East um, and, and how they how where they play a part in HS2. So again, do join us. Um, we will be covering um, very different levels as well. So logistics managers, site managers, etc. Um, and yeah, have a lovely day. I hope the sun comes out. It doesn't look like it's going to maybe tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow's the day or maybe next week when we see you all. Um, so keep smiling, keep in touch and thank you all. Bye. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.